This is Joseph Carpenter. Today is May the 8th, 2024, and I'm interviewing Dr. Sam Haynes. This interview is taking place on the campus of the University of Texas at Arlington and is sponsored by the UTA History Department and College of Liberal Arts. It is part of the UTA Author Insights Collection. Dr. Haynes is a professor of history and director of the Center for Greater Southwestern Studies at the University of Texas at Arlington. He has authored or edited numerous books, articles, essays to include his most recent work, Unsettled Land, from Revolution to Republic, The Struggle for Texas, published by Basic Books in 2022. Thank you for being here. Thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. Thanks for having me. Where are you from originally? And tell me a little bit about your growing up. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm from uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, originally. And um, my father was in the oil business and we traveled a lot. Uh, and I, um, so I didn't live in Shreveport very long. Uh, lived in Canada, uh, lived in um, outside of New York where he worked in Connecticut. And then when I was a little kid, uh, second or third grade, we moved to London and I, I grew up in London and then later in Switzerland. And I came back to the States for college. What university did you attend? So I got my degree from Columbia. Mm -hmm. And for a few years, I didn't do anything. Uh, I wasn't sure that I wanted to pursue graduate degrees in history. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, in the 80s, I found myself in Houston. And I got my MA and my PhD from the University of Houston so in the late 80s. How did you decide to focus on history and Texas history in particular? Um, I've always been interested in history. It's been a consuming passion since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I majored in history uh, in college. Mm -hmm. And when I went back to graduate school, uh, I figured I would be an Americanist. And since I was at the University of Houston, um, at the same time, I was also teaching um, at a private school in Houston, the Kincaid School. Mm -hmm. And so for a year, I taught uh, seventh grade Texas history oh. and decided that I really loved Texas history, and that I wasn't too keen on teaching seventh graders. So <laughs> I did teach, uh, for most of my time at Kincaid, I taught AP US and AP Modern European. But my first year there, I was teaching the Texas history course and became fascinated by the Texas Republic, uh, the nine and a half years that t Texas was a separate and mm -hmm. independent nation. So, um, and then I was doing a graduate work at U of H during that time and decided that my uh, MA thesis and then later, what later became my dissertation would focus on um, a small aspect of the Texas Republic in the 1840s. Talk about some of your previous works. Okay. So my first book was my doctoral dissertation. It came out in 1990. It was called Soldiers of Misfortune, uh, the Mier and Somerville Expeditions. It was about a very minor um, invasion of northern Mexico by uh, uh, and sort of a renegade army of Texans. And it was really looked at uh, the role that it had played in the politics of the Texas Republic mm -hmm. and in the larger international drama between Texas and Mexico, um, the United States and Great Britain. And that was my first book. My second book was a short biography of James K. Polk because I was really interested in um, my, uh, many of my courses, uh, graduate courses had been in the uh, American expansion, American territorial expansion. So that book, uh, published by Longman, uh, was called James K. Polk and the Expansionist Impulse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I spent some chapters on his Tennessee years, but I was really interested in the presidency and how, in this four-year period, he had managed to expand the national domain by about over 30 percent. I came to uh, realize in that second book that how important Great Britain had been in this issue of territorial expansion. So I thought I would write a book on um, manifest destiny, as it's sometimes mm -hmm. called, mm -hmm. uh, and the role that Great Britain had played in spurring that process on. In other words, in spurring the United States to move rapidly across the, uh, uh, the American West to the mm -hmm. Pacific as quickly as possible uh, before Great Britain made inroads there. Right. And that book uh, started off as a fairly narrowly defined, <clears throat> my third book. But as time went on, I realized that this fear of Great Britain, Anglophobia, uh, which had manifested itself in American territorial ex uh, expansionist policies, had been seen in so many other different ways. Mm. And 
So I already had tenure at UTA, and the history department was kind enough to allow me a lot of time to work on that third book. I think it took me about 12 years. Oh, wow. And uh, I knew the, uh, uh, the issue, the, the, the role that Great Britain had played in American uh, foreign policy and territorial expansion. What I had to work on, though, was the role that uh, Great Britain had played in American culture, um, popular culture. Mm -hmm. I have a chapter on theaters and theater riots, uh, highbrow culture, American literature. Um, I have a chapter on British travelogues, uh, Britons who came to uh, the United States and usually said snarky things uh, about uh, <laughs> the early American Republic, uh, much to the fury uh, of Americans. Uh, and then I looked at American uh, economic policy and how tariff policy had been shaped by, um, by the specter of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, U.S. banking policy had been shaped by the specter of Great Britain. And then the last three chapters, which had been the in, initial focus of my book, I think there are 12 chapters in all, uh, was on uh, Manifest Destiny, which of course uh, I discussed Texas in a chapter on Texas, but mm -hmm. also the role that James K. Polk played, mm -hmm. the U.S.-Mexico War, how in many ways Mexico was sort of a, um, a proxy for uh, uh, this American fear of Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain had insinuated itself into so many aspects of Mexican foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that was the third book, and that was called um, uh, Unfinished Revolution, the American Republic, or the Early American Republic, excuse me, the Early American Republic in a British World. I see. And um, you mentioned that you had already received tenure by this time. Mm -hmm. um, Back up a little bit and tell me how you ended up at UTA. I was on the job market, and the, like many um, newly minted PhDs, I uh, was anxious to find a job somewhere, hopefully in Texas, where my wife wanted to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, Dallas, so the Dallas-Fort Worth area, was a, a great um, location for, uh, for her work. And uh, interestingly enough, I'll give you this sort of side note, I don't talk about this very often, but I had been at UTA about a year, and my father asked me uh, if Grubbs Technical College was still in Arlington. And I said, well, I think that UTA is the university that grew out of Grubbs. Right. And he told me uh, that uh, my grandfather had in fact gone to Grubbs Technical College, is and my grandmother had uh, gone to Arlington uh, School District, and the old social work building was her high school. Is that so? Right? Uh, in that respect, my sort of, I had come full circle, and right. I, had, I had I had roots in Arlington that I knew nothing about when I came. Right, that's fascinating. So this was your first job. This was my first job out of graduate school. Wow! And I taught at the Kincaid School for about nine years while oh, I was getting my okay. master's and PhD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then in '93, mm -hmm. I uh, was offered this job and uh, came to Dallas uh, with my family. And then, how did you grow into the director of Southwestern Studies? In 2010, the uh, director of the center, uh, the founding director, in fact, Richard Francavilla, retired. And um, I was interim director for a year, and then after a search, uh, was appointed as a permanent director. And how far into your um, career at UTA was that, that you were appointed director? So that was, well, it was 2010. I think I may have been interim director in, 20, in, in 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, but my third book, Unfinished Revolution, was already in, in press. Mm -hmm. And so it was really a great opportunity for me because like any center director, you are, um, there's a lot of administrative work. And uh, my third book was under wraps. I mean, I think I was doing the indexing at that time. And so um, I was able to devote all of my attention to being center director, uh, which it, it just worked out great for me. So if it was 2009 and I came in 93, that would have been, what, 16 years. I'd been here 16 years before, uh, before taking that job. I didn't expect to be center director. I'd been a center fellow. Uh, since I came in 93. Mm -hmm. There are about half a dozen center fellows mm -hmm. who are associated with the uh, Center for Greater Southwestern Studies. But that was my first um, administrative job. I had always just, I'd been, I had taught and I wrote. That's what I did as an academic. And having um, an administrative job was um, uh, required sort of different 
part of your brain. And, but, it, but it's been fun. I, I've really, I must say, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. So let's move on to your most recent work, Unsettled Land. Tell me a little bit about how you arrived at that subject mm -hmm. and how you came to write it for trade press versus an academic press. Sure. So Unsettled Land was my fourth book, and it was uh, a topic which had really been percolating in my head since, in the, since the 90s, because I <clears throat> came to UTA in 93 and have been teaching uh, the first half of Texas history, Texas uh, history to 1850, mm. um, pretty regularly. I, I would guess almost every year I've been at UTA, I've taught the Texas history class at least once. So um, in a way, Unsettled Land was an opportunity for me to discuss some of the issues that I don't think had been uh, addressed uh, in nearly enough depth mm -hmm. and to um, to correct what I thought was sort of the, the traditional, the, sort of the standard narrative of Texas history. I knew what I wanted to say at the beginning, mm -hmm. and I had a set of goals, and of course, as anyone who has written a book will tell you, those goals do change, or you add new ones, or what have you, uh, but I did have an agenda, mm -hmm. and I was at the Organization for American Historians meeting in New Orleans in 2017, and uh, at, at every major historical conference there is a, a book exhibit. Mm -hmm. And Basic Books, uh, which is a major New York trade press, had, had a, uh, an exhibit there. And I just got to talking to one of the book editors. Normally, uh, the, uh, you, you have an agent, mm -hmm. and the agent pitches the book to a New York press. And I did actually have an agent for a while. And then we had a parting of the ways because I talked, about, talked to her about what I wanted to do in this, in this book. And she really wanted more... The, sort of the traditional figures, more Sam Houston, more Stephen F. Austin. And what I wanted to do was write a book that um, looked at Texas history in a very, very different way uh, that didn't necessarily privilege the people that you and I and every one else in Texas who took seventh grade Texas history right. knows about. Stephen F. Austin, Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie. I wanted to talk about different people. Uh, I wanted to change that narrative, which I thought had was stale and, and essentially a 20th century narrative, which was completely outdated. And so I had this conversation with um, one of the book editors, and he was intrigued by it, and he asked for a prospectus, and then a chapter-by-chapter -chapter summary, and and I must say the process went very quickly. So from the April meeting uh, at the OAH in 2017, I had a contract by the summer, wow. and so. Um, one of the big differences in writing a book for a trade press is uh, it's a commercial um, operation mm -hmm. and university presses don't yes. expect to make a lot of money. Right. And so uh, you are, there, there's a lot more involved. Uh, you have to meet the deadlines that they set. You have to work with the marketing department. Uh, you have to work with the uh, art department. And um, it's, it's, a very, it's a bigger operation than a university press. Right. What did the re re process for research look like for you on this book? So fortunately, I had done a lot of the research already mm -hmm. um, because I had been thinking and writing about different aspects of the topic off and on for a while. Um, but uh, there was a lot more research to be done. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> COVID, of course, came in 2020, and I had not finished the book. I was had another year to go, and so you couldn't get into archives then. Mm. And so I had to cancel some uh, research trips to Mexico. Mm. But, you know, uh, you just simply had to uh, make do. Mm. And I was really fortunate because my office is on the sixth floor of the library. Uh, the center has a great relationship with special collections. And so even during the pandemic, I was able to get access to books that I wouldn't have ac had access to otherwise. Mm. And then very slowly, these archives began to um, uh, change their policies. Uh, very often, at first, it was all done by email. You had to do all your research by uh, sending an email request and having wow. them PDF the documents that you wanted. So that was very time consuming. Mm. And uh, BASIC was uh, nice enough to give me an extension on my contract because nobody had anticipated COVID right. when I signed it. So I was happy enough with the research that I did. If I had had another two or three years, I would have, uh, there, were, were, there would have been archives that I consulted, mm -hmm. but I just didn't have access to them at the time. 
Was there anything that surprised you in your research, any or anybody that surprised you as you were uh, going through uh, the research? For the sure. Book? So the I, I knew I wanted to write a narrative that l looked at Texas history as more than just a history of half a dozen white alpha males, right. like Houston and Crockett and Bowie and so on. And it's important to remember, as and this was uh, the way I pitched the book to Basic, that Texas is one of the most uh, ethnically diverse places in North America uh, in the early decades of the 19th century. Yeah. Um, there are people from all over. Think of it as a place of convergence. Right. There are There's a, an indigenous population, which is quite small, um, but many tribes had come in the 18th century from the West, mm -hmm. like the Apache and the Comanches. Some had come from the Midwest, like the Wichitas. Then in the early 1800s, you have um, immigrants, uh, immigrant tribes from the United States, the Cherokees, the Choctaws, Alabama Cushadas, and so many others. Mm -hmm. All of these people are converging on Texas uh, in the 1700s and uh, early 1800s, uh, before Anglos have arrived. There's a Hispano population there, of course, which came in the 18th century. Mm -hmm. um, and when Anglos come, uh, they, of course, are bringing enslaved people with them, uh, African Americans. Uh, but even the uh, enslaved population is not as monolithic as you might think, um, because in the 1830s, uh, uh, Anglo um, uh, settlers begin to um, buy uh, enslaved people from Cuba. And many of these people were Yoruba-speaking Africans who had only recently endured the horrors of the Middle Passage. They had only been in Cuba a short time, not even long enough to, to learn Spanish. Mm. And so when you think of the enslaved population, even that population is uh, more diverse than you might think. Mm -hmm. So you have this multi-ethnic population and uh, this extraordinary set of conflicts and, and there's collaboration as well among these many peoples. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very complicated story. Mm -hmm. uh, but the traditional narrative has sort of reduced it to a very, very simple story. Mm -hmm. And I, so I knew it was going to be more complicated. Mm -hmm. And because it was a trade press, they uh, wanted me to focus on some individuals. And so I picked a number of people, perhaps too many, mm -hmm. uh, but at least a dozen who I follow throughout this period from the mm -hmm. 20s, 18, 18 teens, to uh, about the time of um, uh, statehood, let's say 1850. And uh, so during that period, I trace about a dozen people. Some of them don't live to 1850, of course. Um, we say goodbye to them at various points right. in the narrative. Uh, but some of them do, mm -hmm. <laughs> still are still alive in the 1850s. And yeah. I talk about uh, their story and how Texas changes from this multi-ethnic, multi-racial society in, in the Mexican period to a society which is really... Um, unfortunately, you know, committed to the ideology of white rule after mm -hmm. uh, 1836, after the Texas Revolution is over. And in every standard um, history of this period, the Texas Revolution is always where the story ends. Um, it ends with a, a crash of cymbals and a blast of trumpets at right. the Battle of San Jacinto. Right. And I wanted to write a book where San Jacinto was the midpoint of the narrative. So it is the chapters that follow where you learn what happens to these people, this, mm -hmm. um, what happens to uh, people of color mm -hmm. in this multiracial society as they transition from this multiracial society that the Mexican Republic was to one to the Texas Republic. And there is this process of ethnic cleansing. Uh, with regard to Native Americans, certainly, uh, which is a, a, a very complicated story, which I wanted to tell. And um, I just felt that um, we've periodized, to use a historical term, a fancy historical term, we've periodized this all wrong. So we sort of think of it as ending in the Texas, with the, uh, with the Battle of San Jacinto, mm -hmm. end of the Texas Revolution. But that story continues for another 10 years at least. Mm -hmm. And that's really, we need to know what kind of society uh, Anglo settlers wanted uh, when they rebelled against Mexico uh, in 1835 and 1836. So that was the story that I wanted to tell, and a story which gave uh, attention to, um, brought into this narrative, uh, uh, people of color, mm -hmm. Native Americans, African Americans, mm -hmm. um, Hispanos, and so on.
Uh, I didn't just want to focus on Sam Houston and Crockett and Travis and, and women. Austin. And women as well. And so I, um, I, you know, I do talk about these rather traditional figures um, at, uh, throughout the narrative, particularly somebody like Sam Houston. Um, uh, so I don't want to suggest that I ignore them, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to tell a, a more complicated story, which I think the, uh, the history of Texas definitely is. Mm -hmm. So how do you hope that this book is going to contribute to the, the discourse over the history of Texas. All I, all I can say is that I hope the book will contribute in some way mm -hmm. to a fundamental reappraisal of Texas history in this very formative period, what I call the birth of early modern Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, that narrative took shape in the 20th century, and I think it's an outdated narrative, and it's one that we just simply need to set aside. Mm -hmm. It's a narrative which <clears throat> was written by um, Anglo uh, males primarily, mm -hmm. and it privileged Anglo males. Mm -hmm. This is a narrative which really hasn't changed much uh, during the, in the 20th century. Um, we, I think even in the 90s um, or 80s when I was in graduate school, we knew it was a very Anglo-centric narrative, mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't quite know what to do about it, how to change it. And I think one of the things that we did was, uh, I'm speaking of the profession generally, was insert people of color into that traditional narrative. And the mm -hmm. problem with that is it doesn't change the contours of the narrative. The right. narrative remains exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do was to bring people of color into the mix and to see how that narrative sort of shaped up. And what mm -hmm. I found was, and I think you asked me earlier, um, you know, what did I want to do with this book? Well, I knew I wanted to talk about people of color in addition to the whites that we know so much about. Mm -hmm. But what I found was that they, by bringing them into the narrative, they shaped the contours of the narrative completely so that it's almost totally unrecognizable mm -hmm. from that traditional narrative. And I'll right. give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, for in most traditional histories, uh, the birth of our early modern Texas begins with Stephen F. Austin, mm -hmm. uh, Moses Austin, mm -hmm. and then Stephen F. Austin, the founding of that early colony, the old 300. And it's important to remember that uh, the first American uh, immigrants to Texas are Native American immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, Alabamas and Cushadas may be here in the 1810s. Uh, the Cherokees were certainly here in 1819, if not earlier. And Native Americans are coming into Texas in larger numbers than Anglos in the 1820s. But the first, but what, what we tell students is Mexico wins its independence, Stephen F. Austin comes, and this new Anglo colony takes shape. We don't talk about the thousands of immigrant Native Americans from the United States. And that, in the early chapters, I, I start with those people. So the first chapter, I don't know if Stephen F. Austin is mentioned, he may be, but uh, he's not the, the focus of that chapter. The first chapter is the Cherokees, and mm -hmm. the group that I focus on are from Western North Carolina, mm -hmm. and their migration to Missouri, and then to Oklahoma, and then finally down into Texas. That takes about uh, 10 years for them to make that trek to finally wind up in Texas, but they're there before Stephen F. Austin. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, uh, and I did that deliberately, and uh, I don't really talk about Austin in any depth until like chapter three, uh, which is, I think, a marked departure from the traditional narrative. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to start that way, and there are many other examples in the book that mm -hmm. I could give you, but uh, I think I was sort of consciously trying to turn that traditional narrative on its head. And this style of, of, of narrative or, or history that had been basically decided upon previously was very similar to the lost cause narrative after, uh, that developed after the Civil War. So it's, um, that's interesting. I mean, you can compare it to the myth of the lost cause. Mm -hmm. And it is one of these narratives which becomes calcified over time and is very sort of resistant to revisionist challenge. Uh, but I would say that unlike the myth of the lost cause, which really did, I think, die 
maybe a, a slow death, but um, a death nonetheless uh, by the 1950s. Uh, the traditional narrative, uh, the heroic narrative of the Alamo and San Jacinto, mm -hmm. uh, that narrative is alive and well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. um, it has been almost impossible to get people to think of this period in terms other than t um, a narrative that focuses on the Alamo. Um, there was a, a, a year before my book came out, there was a very controversial book called Forget the Alamo mm -hmm. um, by three, uh, three uh, former journalists. And it was, um, took a very sort of um, a revisionist approach, um, but it's sort of an anti-heroic approach. Mm -hmm. And um, in, and I've used the book in class, and in many ways, it's 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 a useful book. Uh, but one of the things that it did not do was forget the Alamo. Uh, the book is all about the Alamo, of course, and um, we still think of Texas history in those kinds of terms. Um, when I pitched the book to Basic, I said, you know, there's more to this period than a 13-day siege in San Antonio, right. and uh, they said, great, write that book. So I did, and uh, during the editing process, I received an email with a PDF attachment saying, here is your cover art for the book. We hope you like it. And I clicked on the uh, PDF, and to my horror, there was an image of the uh, Alamo uh, with smoke rising from the walls. <laughs> so I immediately had to contact my editor and say, but this is not the book that I've written. So right. the book is about 400 pages, I guess, if yes. you include notes and mm -hmm. everything else. And um, I have about three or four pages on the Alamo. Yes. And, and, and that's about right, if you mm -hmm. ask me. Uh, yeah. it, was a, it was a fairly minor battle in the whole, whole was scheme a minor of battle. things. And it was a minor battle, yeah. and it does not change the military outcome of the Texas Revolution. Mm -hmm. When I speak to civic groups, I have to explain to them that um, the Alamo had been, had been indeed forgotten in uh, the latter decades of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And it was only, it, it acquired new meaning in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about that traditional narrative, you have to remember that these are events that we have only ex inscribed meaning upon later. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to do was you know, to tell the story of Texas uh, from a very, very different standpoint, what really did happen. Uh, Who was your target audience? Um, well, I would hope that everybody who enjoys Texas history, who wants to see Texas history in a different way, I think that would be an audience. I think uh, Americans in general, because let's face it, the, the story of Texas uh, is, is one that has national appeal. I also wanted to, uh, even though it's not a scholarly book, I wanted to make some larger points about that traditional narrative mm -hmm. and offer um, uh, new paths to explore in the future. How, what other things can we study? I and mean, we haven't um, mined this period, uh, even though we've mined it exhaustively, mm -hmm. there are still new things that we can do. Uh, to, um, to enrich our knowledge of this period. We haven't spent nearly enough uh, attention on the immigrant tribes. Uh, I tried to um, uh, address that in, um, in my book, but it's really an overview. I'm take, it's a 25-year period I'm covering. So I didn't have time uh, to do a deep dive into uh, the immigrant tribes, but I was shocked at how little uh, literature there was on these people. And in so many ways, I think uh, that traditional narrative, which was fine at the time, I mean, it was a perfectly serviceable narrative in the 20th century. But now, if you really want to include the stories of everyone, not just a few, a handful of white alpha males, if you want to include the story of everyone, mm -hmm. then you realize pretty quickly that that story begins, on to, begins to take on an entirely different shape than the one that's familiar to so many people. So um, even to academics, it's not a book where I go into the historiography, uh, mm -hmm. certainly not in the text. There's some historiography in the notes. Right. Uh, but I would hope that historians of the period wouldn't look at the book as just simply a synthesis of the existing literature, because I, I don't think it is a synthesis of the existing literature. I think it's what I'm trying to do is, is rewrite uh, 
that narrative and not to revise that narrative. And I don't want to sound immodest, but uh, I don't think that you can revise that traditional narrative. You just simply need to set it aside mm -hmm. and say, all right, let's start again. What would it look like if we were writing this narrative for the first time in 2024? Mm -hmm. And the answer okay. is nothing like the narrative that we had right. in uh, throughout the 20th century. Talk about the Cherokee for a minute, because I, I think that the common perception of all Native American tribes was that they were nomadic within a certain geography, et cetera. <clears throat> the Cherokees, not so much. They, they were sedentary um, when they came to Texas. One of the things that I try to tell people and try to tell students is that if you really want to understand Native Americans, you need to see them as micro societies. And these are very small groups of people and, uh, and they evolve. Small groups of people change much more quickly as societies than large nation states. So that when the Cherokees are part groups of uh, Cherokees, and usually they, vill whole villages would move together. And the people that I'm interested in who uh, start off in Western um, North Carolina and who leave in 1811, uh, they are heading West and they become part of this migration 20 years before the Trail of Tears, by the way. Mm. And they're the Western Cherokees. And the Western Cherokees and the Eastern Cherokees, um, there are, um, they are obviously the same group of people, but it doesn't take long for the uh, Western Cherokees to change dramatically from the people that they've left behind. Mm. And so you find two very, very different groups of people calling themselves Cherokees. Mm. And when you do an even deeper dive into East Texas, you realize that although very often um, people refer to these Native Americans as the Cherokees and their and the other tribes as if they're all somehow the same. Mm -hmm. You learn pretty quickly that the Cherokees are a self-contained group between the Neches and the Angelina rivers north of Nacogdoches. Mm -hmm. The Choctaws are elsewhere in East Texas and they are they do not have a lot of common a lot in common or a lot of contact with uh, the Cherokees. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing goes for the Shawnees and the Delawares, who are way far up north, uh, just south of the of the Red River, mm -hmm. or the Alabama and Cushada, who are living in the heart of the Big Thicket uh, area, uh, north of Beaumont. Um, there are all of these tribes, and you need to study them all individually, because they've come from different parts of the United States. Um, there is, in fact, and I was fascinated by a, uh, a tribal conference that Sam Houston calls be, between Texas diplomats and all of the tribes of Texas in 1844. And they all came, uh, not just the immigrant tribes, but the, the, the Comanches came and the Apaches came. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about it was um, they couldn't communicate with each other. Uh, they spoke uh, pidgin Spanish mm -hmm. and pidgin English. Mm -hmm. And when that didn't work, they uh, used sign language. Mm -hmm. And that just brought home to me you know, this salient fact that we can't just simply refer to these people as somehow, you know, monolithic, as, as Indians. Uh, they are micro societies and you need to understand them on their own terms. And also mm -hmm. separate and apart from the Anglo experience. Again, as I was mentioned earlier, can't just sort of shoehorn them into that traditional right. narrative. Um, you need to understand what Comanches are doing Mm -hmm. Not vis-a-vis -vis Americans or even vis-a-vis -vis Cherokees, but what they are doing and what mm -hmm. their agenda, what their goals are. And you'll find that it's, it's a very different set of goals than the Shawnees mm -hmm. and the Delawares. And that's why um, you know, we talk a lot about settler uh, uh, Indian violence, uh, but there's a great deal of intertribal rivalry as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Wichitas and the, and the Cherokees were constantly at war with each other over a long period of time. Mm. And, um, and they were motivated by a set of concerns, which are very often sort of ignored by Anglo historians. So it's a very complicated story when you bring in Native Americans and you mm. seriously try to, uh, to study them alongside Anglo-Americans. One thing that you brought out in the book that was particularly interesting was that um, the Cherokees that were in East Texas were applying for land grants just as 
the whites were applying for land grants. Right. That is outside the, uh, the, the usual narrative. In the traditional narrative, yeah. Stephen of Austin goes to Mexico City, tries to uh, get uh, land grants, and, and tries to have his father's land grant confirmed. Uh, there are other empresarios who are there in Mexico City. And uh, what we forget is uh, the Cherokees were there too, uh, at exactly the same time. Mm. And um, they, were, they wanted exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have deep pockets like the Anglo-Americans did. It, it took money to be an empresario. Mm. Um, but, uh, and so they were essentially penniless, which was one of the reasons why the Mexican government was less interested in, in, lis in, in uh, listening to their petitions. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the early 20s, told them to go home. Um, <clears throat> but they still wanted and understood um, that the only way they could stay there permanently uh, was to gain legal title and this was something they had learned from the, uh, from the Americans, mm. all right? Uh, Richard Fields, who was a Cherokee leader, who had speculated in lands uh, in, uh, in Tennessee, uh, and I believe in Arkansas and Oklahoma, before he came to Texas. Uh, he understood that better than any other Cherokee leader. And so in the early 20s, makes the, um, the, uh, this effort on the part of the Cherokees, this petition for, for land from the Mexican government, um, something that is so important to him uh, and it is a tragic, tragic story. Um, he's eventually killed um, mm. by uh, his own people, as it happens, when he mm. tries to take part in the Fredonia Rebellion. Mm. But the uh, Cherokee desire for legal title goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the tragic stories of their history in Texas is that in 1832, it looked like they might actually get what they wanted. Uh, because Mier y Tehran, who was, uh, uh, had control of, the, uh, of Texas at the time, was administrating that area, realized, having failed at bringing Mexican citizens north to settle Texas, realized that the Native Americans who were there wanted to be citizens, were, would be law-abiding, and a, a land distribution program would work uh, to everyone's benefit, mm -hmm. to the Mexican government's benefit and to the Native Americans' benefit, and tried to put that in motion. And uh, the uh, commanding officer in Nacogdoches was willing to uh, put into effect a, um, it was going to issue land titles. And the governor of Coila uh, supported uh, this effort as well. And in the summer of 32, uh, Mieri Tehran commits suicide mm. for reasons unrelated to the Cherokees. Mm -hmm. um, the following month, uh, that's in July, I believe, and then in August, the, uh, the uh, commanding officer in Nacogdoches who was going to issue those land titles, uh, was overthrown by, mm -hmm. in a rebellion. And the month after that, the governor of, uh, in Coila um, dies of yellow fever. Mm -hmm. And so these three people who could have put that policy into effect uh, were now dead. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, uh, there was never any chance after that that the Mexican government was going to um, uh, t take seriously uh, Cherokee land claims, although they continued to petition the government in the years that followed. And so that explains why, when the revolution came uh, in February of 1836, the Cherokees had, were now so um, exasperated with the uh, inertia of the Mexican government mm -hmm. uh, that they did listen to uh, the Texas leaders, and in particular Sam Houston, who had long contacts uh, with uh, the Cherokees. Mm -hmm. And so they the Cherokees and other tribes agreed to uh, remain neutral. And I think you can make a pretty compelling case that it was their neutrality which was a decisive factor in the outcome of the Texas Revolution. Had they, been, had they received land from the Mexican government, they undoubtedly would have fought alongside the Mexican army. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the story of the Texas Revolution would have ended very differently. Mm. What other characters in your story really stand out to you? Okay, um, without going into too much detail, there are so many. Mm -hmm. um, one of the people who I became very, I became fascinated with was uh, William Wharton, who is largely ignored uh, in the coming of the Texas Revolution. William Wharton was a, um, a, a plantation owner, uh, enslaver, uh, and one of, one of the richest men in Texas. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the 1830s, and he, in many ways, was a, he was a radical and the most prominent radical 
And I liken him to uh, Samuel Adams. If you take Samuel Adams out of, out of Boston in the 1770s, you're not quite sure whether a revolution uh, occurs there. And the same thing is true. Uh, he's a, he's a William Wharton is a pamphleteer. He's a propagandist. Mm -hmm. uh, he was politically savvy in ways that Stephen Austin was not. Uh, the radicals really were uh, a, a political organization. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty clear from, I would say, 32 and maybe even earlier, 1832, uh, this rebellion is, is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's going to happen because William Wharton, with his younger brother John, are, um, are very much involved in radicalizing that Anglo community. So that's one person. Mm -hmm. um, one of the people who, uh, I, when, I, when people read the book and they talk to me about it, they always talk about William Goyens, mm -hmm. who is a fascinating figure. Yes. He was a, a free man of color and he lived in Nacogdoches, and he was one of the largest landowners in Nacogdoches in the Mexican period. Uh, he came as a blacksmith, he opened a blacksmith shop, uh, but very quickly he starts to speculate in land. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a um, carting trade, uh, he drives um, uh, carts, mule-driven carts, to, from uh, Nacogdoches to Nacogdoches mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Cherokee skins and furs and various other supplies, um, agricultural produce and what have you. Uh, he builds an inn in town in Na Nacogdoches. Mm -hmm. He has a, um, a grist mill and a sawmill mm -hmm. eventually. Um, he is a very, very prominent citizen. Mm -hmm. He doesn't run for office, but he campaigns for others who do. Uh, he turns out to be litigious. Uh, incredibly so, and although he doesn't have uh, much of a written record, uh, he doesn't have a diary, doesn't have correspondence mm. that we can find, uh, you can trace his career through his lawsuits in Nacogdoches. Was that out of necessity? Well, I think everybody was very litigious in okay. uh, that period, for one thing. Uh, but uh, he was... Um, uh, was it out of necessity because he was being taken advantage of yes, by whites? Yes. Not necessarily. Um, or discriminated. Against. No, I, well, I think that's a, that, that's a very um, satisfying answer. I'm not, doesn't explain why he was so litigious in the Mexican period. So uh, you may be right about the years that follow. Right. Uh, but I'm inclined to believe he was just litigious by nature. Okay. And, um, but, but he was very good at it. And he has, um, and it's a remarkable journey because no single human being, I would say, no, no one's life is upended more profoundly than someone like William Goins mm -hmm. uh, by the Texas Revolution. Yes. Because now, suddenly, he's not a citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, he can't vote. He can't take part in political life. He can't... Um, represent himself in court. Uh, he actually, in 1840, the Texas Republic passed a law saying that uh, free people of color had to leave um, and could only remain if they had uh, um, a law passed on their behalf, a, a specific law passed on their behalf, mm -hmm. allowing them to stay. And William Goins was able to do that because he had friends in high places. He was on very close terms with uh, uh, Sam Houston and uh, Thomas Rusk and, and others uh, who were uh, powerful in, in East Texas, prominent in East mm -hmm. Texas. So that's, a, uh, that's an extraordinary story. And, uh, yes. and one of the things that I, uh, that I enjoyed uh, was that I, I think I talk about him in the first chapter and I'm still talking about him in the last chapter. Uh, so he is one of those people who mm -hmm. survived mm -hmm. and who was, even, even after the Texas Revolution, uh, was able to keep much of his um, land empire intact. And when he dies, uh, I, uh, he uh, leaves, uh, I think, more than 10,000 acres of land uh, in the Nacogdoches area. Wow. Uh, he is still prominent uh, despite the fact that clearly the political landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's a survivor. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was one of those people who um, don't make it into these traditional history books. Yes. Uh, he's um, not particularly prominent, although you know, he was very important in, in understanding um, uh, the, the Texas Republic's relations with the Cherokees, because he spoke Cherokee fluently, and he was really Sam Houston's Indian agent. He was the mm. first Indian agent of the Texas Republic. Uh, 
So that's interesting. He's he's prominent in a lot of ways, yes. but I uh, enjoyed talking about him mm -hmm. because he was someone who um, very often sort of is, is under the radar and uh, has a remarkable career. And there were people of color. Uh, he was an exception. I don't want to suggest that in any way he was typical right. of free men of color. He was really the exception to the rule. But he was. Um, it's it's a remarkable story, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you start in the 1820s when Mexico, uh, the Mexican Republic, is by no means a colorblind society. Nobody would ever say that it was. I'm not saying that it was. Mm -hmm. um, but the, those racial boundaries snap taut mm -hmm. in, in a very, very dramatic way mm -hmm. uh, with the Texas Revolution. Yes. And uh, he sees the effects of that, mm -hmm. as, they, as everyone does. Talk a little bit about Sarah Maverick. What does she add to the story? So Sarah Maverick was a, um, I was very pleased uh, to have her diary and memoirs. Mm. And they were in the Briscoe in, in Austin, the Briscoe Library at UT Austin. And I, during COVID, I thought, well, they have been published. And so, and I am short of time. <laughs> And uh, I uh, am having a hard time getting anything mm -hmm. from any library. Right. And I said, all right, I'm, I'll just use the published version. And I was really glad that I uh, kept at the Briscoe and said, you know, I really want to see the manuscript itself. Mm -hmm. And the reason I was so uh, delighted by that was because I found that it was the family that had published the memoir. And um, the memoir, it was a memoir that included some of her letters and some of her uh, passages from the diary. They had been abridged mm -hmm. and um, to make, uh, as you, know, you might expect, uh, to, uh, to put her in the best possible light. Mm -hmm. And she's still a, um, I think, a compelling figure, in many ways a tragic figure. She loses four children to disease mm -hmm. and uh, in very quick succession, by the way, and was traumatized by that experience. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, she's sort of the stalwart Anglo um, pioneer. Mm -hmm. And uh, she arrives in San Antonio. She may be the first Anglo woman who came to San Antonio and stayed. Mm -hmm. And by the time of her death, uh, there's, um, uh, there's streetcar service, trolley service in San Antonio. Wow. Um, she was there for about half a century. Mm -hmm. And she saw this village, this windswept, dusty village, mm -hmm. turn into a not a major metropolitan area, mm -hmm. but certainly a, a small city at the time of her death. And so she saw everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the diary is just great on, on that basis alone. But it was also important because uh, she talks about uh, the enslaved people of her household in very uncharitable terms. Yes. And so I thought that needed to go into that story as well. I mean, I'm really attracted by, as a, as a writer, attracted to characters who are just like the people I, I know in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, they have flaws and they have virtues. And I, I really don't have any time for sort of heroic narratives. Mm -hmm. And I know people often say that, you know, biographers fall in love with their subjects quite often. Mm -hmm. um, I've never done that. And so I found her a compelling figure, uh, but a, a woman with, with, with flaws uh, that were just as uh, apparent as, as her vir virtues. And, and uh, I would say the same for other people as well. I mean, I like Sam Houston. I found him to be a very um, compelling figure. And in many ways, much more enlightened on issues of race than his contemporaries. And, uh, and yet, uh, he lies to the Cherokees. Mm -hmm. And he lies to the Cherokees because he happens to be the president of a white republic. Right. And uh, he found himself in a very difficult position. And so uh, it, it didn't surprise me mm -hmm. um, when uh, he writes to Chief Bowles, who was a, a friend at the time. And, in, and I, name, I have a chapter um, titled, I Have Never Told You a Lie. And that was not his first, and that would not be his last. Uh, but I, but you, know, you, I, you have to feel for Houston. I mean, if you study uh, the correspondence, you, are, you come away with no doubt that he was really shocked by the treatment of the Cherokees um, and tried to address it, uh, was unsuccessful, was not in Texas at the time. He was in Alabama during the expulsion of the Cherokees by Lamar. But when he came back, uh, 
uh, speech after speech after speech, uh, he raised the issue of the Cherokee expulsion. And to very inhospitable uh, uh, audiences, mm. uh, he arrives in Nacogdoches and um, after his trip through the South. And uh, the first, and he gives a speech in Nacogdoches, which, and you have to imagine that everybody who was there had been involved in the expulsion in July of 1839. Uh, men who had fought Cherokees at the Battle of the Neches, mm -hmm. uh, where Bowles had died. Mm -hmm. And yet still, uh, we don't have a, a record of that speech, but we have, um, but people talked about it. And uh, he was furious at the treatment of the Cherokees. Mm. And uh, continued in the, was, he was elected to Congress and uh, continued to talk, to take up the, the Cherokees cause. By that time it was too late. They had already been forced into Oklahoma. Mm. But uh, I have no doubt that he was sincere. Uh, but he was, as president, put in a very, very difficult position mm. where he had to you know, fulfill his, his, his political obligations um, and, there was no way you could satisfy both the Cherokees and the uh, and Anglo settlers who were moving into that area. Talk about Lamar for a minute, because Lamar was kind of the anti-Houston right. of the story. Right. So talk a little bit about uh, Lamar and, and, and his role in uh, uh, Texas government. Sure. Um, I said a minute ago that I found... You know, Houston to be a very compelling figure, a man with you know flaws and virtues, um, but it's hard to say the same about Lamar, um, because his attitude toward Native Amer to the immigrant tribes, is uh, is 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 shocking, mm -hmm. quite frankly, and everybody knows the story of the Trail of Tears, mm -hmm. uh, which t occur which occurs in the winter of thirty eight thirty nine. Um, in many ways, Lamar's expulsion of the Cherokees in Texas, <clears throat> which takes place in the summer of 39, is, is worse um, because the Cherokees have been there for 20 years. Mm. They've been there longer than almost all of the Anglo-Americans living in Texas, wow. if not all of them. Right. And um, they did not have legal title to land. As we've said earlier, the Mexican government did not give them legal title. But Lamar refused to recognize any Indian sovereignty, any tribal sovereignty. Mm. And so they were going to be expelled regardless. And he would not negotiate, really, uh, with um, Native American leaders. There were meetings between um, Texas diplomats, Indian uh, negotiators, and, uh, and, the, and the tribes. But it was always that they had to leave. Uh, the position of the Lamar government never, never changed. It was, you will leave and you will not be compensated for the land mm. uh, that you have uh, occupied for 20 years. Mm. And even the U.S. government uh, did not do that. Uh, if you look at American Indian policy, as, mm. as, as, as shocking as it was in many respects, mm -hmm. um, Lamar's refusal to even recognize tribal sovereignty puts it in a different league, I would say, right. uh, than even... Uh, the United States and its Indian policy. Mm. So ultimately, what is um, what is the discussion that you would like to occur around this book? And uh, the book came out in 2022. Mm -hmm. So, what discussions uh, has the book raised? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope that. Um, you know, the book is there, available. I, uh, I don't know if it has changed any people's minds, um, but uh, I, I hope it does. And I know when I speak to civic groups, mm -hmm. I um, make clear some of the main points that I've made in the book and we're making today, uh, that we have this traditional narrative mm -hmm. that has kind of outlived its, its usefulness. Um, we need to sort of, we need to rethink um, the history of this formative period. Uh, in the history of Texas, mm -hmm. uh, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. And uh, that narrative has been almost sort of, you know, frozen uh, for a very, very long period of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, all we've done, really, I think all we did in the 20th century um, is sort of drill down into this sort of minutiae mm 
and ask questions like, you know, how did Davy die? Or did Travis draw a line in the sand? Right. And I just find that well, so obviously problematic, yes. um, which is why I said earlier, we just need to sort of set that aside. <clears throat> we have inscribed meaning onto these events. Um, what's truly exciting about studying um, these decades in the history of Texas is that if you think that they have been exhaustively mined, you are flat wrong. Right. Uh, because we've just told the story the same way over and over and over, mm. and we've just gotten deeper and deeper and deeper into those weeds. And there are people that we just don't talk about. And the questions that have been asked in the past have been questions about that narrative, like the Travis and the, and the line in the sand. Right. So we start delving deeper into the existing narrative right. rather than expanding that out. That's true. So how, uh, how has the book been received by uh, fellow academics? It's been received well by scholars. I, um, I, I think I very well. Um, mm -hmm. There have been reviews in uh, academic journals and they've been, they've been great. I have, I, have, I have no complaints whatsoever. I, the, I think some, you know, some, you know, we live in polarized times and I, I think some people will find it, um, will be offended by the narrative. Mm -hmm. But I would urge them to sort of read the whole thing. You know, I, I guess all I can say to people like that is that this is not an anti-heroic narrative. Right. You know, uh, I have no time for anti-heroic narratives mm -hmm. any more than I have time for a heroic narrative. Right. You know, as a historian, you should just try to figure out what the hell happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's what I'm doing. And um, so this I think there is a sensitivity on the part of many people who love that traditional narrative, mm -hmm. that the only thing scholars are doing are sort of bashing their, their precious heroes. Right. And that's not the goal, mm -hmm. uh, at least it's not my goal. Uh, I'm just trying to understand who these people are mm -hmm. and right. who they are in um, the context of, of other people. And, and we have to acknowledge that this is a racially diverse region. Mm -hmm. Only half the people and perhaps not even half the people in Texas are Anglo uh, when the revolution occurs. Mm -hmm. And so do you want to talk about the other half or not? Right. Uh, that's really what I tell civic groups that are initially somewhat suspicious mm -hmm. of an academic coming in and telling them that, you know, about the Alamo. Right. Well, talk about the pushback that you've gotten, because there has, there has been some pushback. I don't know how broad that pushback is, has, has you been. Know, I, it, it hasn't, you know, I, I don't, you know, I anticipated some and, and there has been and uh, I, I'm fine with it. I'm just, I don't take it personally and I'm just more distressed by the fact that we can't have a serious discussion mm -hmm. about these events. Right. It's not about ego uh, at all. Um, I uh, have always tried to have and have had um, productive, fruitful conversations with scholars whose views are more traditional than mine. Mm -hmm. And I think that you can learn from traditionalists. Mm -hmm. uh, when I wrote the book, uh, I sent the manuscript out to some friends. And one person uh, was a traditional historian. Uh, who, who knew the military side of the Texas Revolution far better than me. Mm. And uh, I was very uh, grateful for his, for his comments. Mm -hmm. I have no idea whether he agreed with the larger themes of the book or not. Mm -hmm. And I never asked him because I really didn't want to know. I mean, I hoped he was convinced, but if he wasn't, then um, that's not why I asked him mm -hmm. to read the manuscript. Mm -hmm. the, I wanted him to read the manuscript because I... Uh, don't mind saying I'm not a military historian. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to get the story right, and I wanted to give it to someone who studied that, uh, that story uh, and had spent a long time in the weeds of that story, far more than me. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I would hope that um, you know, we as a profession um, and, and also as, as a uh, society, Tex I'm talking about Texans in general, can have a uh, just a serious conversation mm 
about what the birth of early modern Texas was really all about. Right. The story of Texas in these decades is relentlessly fascinating and extraordinarily complex yes. when you bring all of these people into that story. And if you try to tell that story, then, then you end up with a book that has four pages on the Alamo. <laughs> right. So what have you found to be the most rewarding aspect of writing this book? Because it's different from your other books sure. in that it is more for a popular audience. That's right. So um, my mother did not live to see this book, but she had read everything that I wrote before. And she wasn't a trained academic, but as her son, she was going to read everything her son wrote. Of course. And she said, you know, I don't think you've ever met a semicolon you didn't like. <laughs> That's what she said about my third book. And, and she was right, because uh, I love semicolons, uh, and I, it takes me a long time to say anything uh, in, in a sentence yes. uh, with you know, caveats and so on. Right. Um, but I w what was great about the book, so much fun about it, was that I was writing for a popular audience. I wanted to say things um, that were important, I think, as uh, two historians. But uh, Basic wouldn't have let me write a book for historians. Basic mm -hmm. said, this has to be character driven. Mm -hmm. right. And if there weren't people, uh, human beings, uh, fleshed out characters mm -hmm. on every page, uh, then I was going to hear f from my editor about it. And so writing for a popular audience was a lot of fun mm -hmm. um, I, and harder than I thought yes. because I, there are a couple of people who are historians who'd made that transition and, it's, uh, and have done it incredibly well mm -hmm. and who were able to write in short, pithy sentences. Right. And, um, uh, and I found that having been an academic, having written academic prose for so long, I found that was, it was hard to mm -hmm. suddenly write short, pithy sentences. Mm -hmm. but, so I don't know that I did it as well as the people I was trying to emulate, mm -hmm. uh, but, I, uh, but it was fun. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, uh, I, I know for a fact it's more, it's more readable than my third book on um, you know, an American conflicted identity vis-a-vis -vis Great Britain. Right. You know, uh, this was, uh, it's, it's a book to be read. Right. And so uh, very often, we don't think about our audience as historians. Mm -hmm. We're only writing for other historians. Right. And so that was the fun part of the book mm -hmm. and, and the challenge. And have you um, received positive feedback from other, other than your mom, uh, have you received positive feedback from other non-scholars who, who have I think read? so. Oh, I know so. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. People who've read the book have, um, told me that they learned a lot yes. uh, and, it, and it's, it's very gratifying. And, yes. and also that I was able to sort of bring alive certain people, yes. some of whom we've talked about mm -hmm. uh, in the narrative that they knew nothing about. Right. Richard Fields, we talked about Indian, uh, the, the, the Cherokee search for, for title. Uh, somebody like Richard Fields mm -hmm. is really a fascinating character who tries to create this sort of pan-Indian alliance uh, in 1826. In reference to characters, yeah, um, you brought out uh, uh, Juan Seguin as another mm -hmm. uh, uh, character that uh, maybe uh, people were familiar with. Obviously, you know, there's a town called Seguin and uh, mm -hmm. and all of that. But you went into more detail about kind of his um, changing role. Within right. the Texas, um, okay. Story. So that's, I think, a, a really good example of how that traditional narrative has sort of inserted people of color, mm. um, and then, but not used them to tell a different story. So, a lot of uh, people I run into know that Juan Seguin supported the Texas Revolution, mm -hmm. and they know that he was a messenger from the Alamo. And they know that he fought alongside Sam Houston at San Jacinto. Mm -hmm. Probably no one saw more, uh, had more battlefield experience uh, during that uh, period, uh, 1835 to 1836, than, than Juan Seguin. But w w uh, mentioned less often is that as mayor of San Antonio in the early 1840s, uh, he was accused by Anglo-American 
residents of being a traitor. Mm -hmm. And so he has to flee. Uh, he is being pursued you know, by a, a mob, which would undoubtedly have killed him. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, uh, like many uh, Tejanos, was forced to flee uh, below the Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. And in the fall of 1842, only a few months later, uh, he comes back. And this time, um, he is in a Mexican army officer's uniform, and he is leading uh, Mexican soldiers against uh, the uh, Anglo uh, residents of the town. Mm -hmm. And um, so he's, he joins the Mexican army and not only fights uh, uh, for uh, the Mexican army in 1842 and, and afterwards, but in the U.S.-Mexico War. Uh, and it appears that he is commanding a group of men who were um, his friends and neighbors uh, from, uh, from San Antonio, mm. um, the defenders of Behar, they mm. were known. Right. And the defenders of Behar had been you know, defending the town from the Indians, uh, uh, Comanche depredations mm. uh, in the 1830s. But by the 40s, they were um, fighting on behalf of Mexico against... Anglo-Americans who had now, um, even though Mexicans uh, were granted citizenship in the Texas Constitution, were really treated as second-class citizens. Mm -hmm. And life for many Tejanos was intolerable, yes. so they left. Right. Um, and so that second half of the story mm -hmm. is, not, um, is not mentioned as frequently. Right. You know, it's, it's Juan Seguin's role in the Texas Revolution, mm -hmm. but he clearly realized he had made a mistake in his support of Anglo resistance. Mm -hmm. uh, he lived to regret it. Mm -hmm. And he was actually rather late to that uh, conclusion mm -hmm. because there were plenty of other Tejanos who had decided early on that this was not a rebellion that they wanted to be involved in. Looking forward, talk a little bit about what future projects might look like for you. Okay, so uh, right now <clears throat> I'm going back to uh, my role as center director. And uh, we had, uh, when I first started in 20, uh, really about 2010, uh, we started a, a digital humanities project on the U.S.-Mexico war called A Continent Divided. Mm -hmm. And in 2015, um, I decided that I wanted to um, do a, another project on interethnic violence in Texas. Mm -hmm. And it really was an opportunity for me to understand uh, Comanche raiding patterns better, and Wichita raiding patterns better, and um, and and just understanding the, the the conflicts that were just of, of which there were so many, mm -hmm. um, and so I started that project really as a way of helping me. I didn't know I was going to write the uh, um, Unsettled Land at that time, uh, but um, but it was helpful um, when I got the contract. But the, so I had to put it aside when I was writing Unsettled Land, and now I've come back to it. Mm -hmm. And so um, the short answer is uh, I'm going back to digital humanities projects. I see. And uh, A Continent Divided, um, the one of the Mexican War, but most uh, urgently now, I, I think I've been focusing all my attention on this uh, interethnic violence uh, digital humanities project, which we will roll out again. Mm -hmm. It was online for several years, but we're going to uh, do a new rollout mm -hmm. and call it um, Texas in Turmoil. Mm -hmm. And it'll be interethnic violence from the uh, Mexican period, 1821, and we're going to go right up to uh, Reconstruction and the end of the so-called Indian Wars. I see. What advice do you have for students or for others who are interested in, in, in pursuing a, a career in academia or a career in research, a career in writing? Well, sometimes um, students have asked me, you know, can you make a living just writing? And the answer is, no, you can't. <laughs> uh, so you need another, you need a day job. Right. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, we don't live in a culture that reads as much as they used mm -hmm. to. And so, uh, you know, teaching in a university or having some other form of employment is, is, is important. I would say to graduate students um, that versatility. Uh, when I was coming up 
uh, through, when I was going through graduate school, you really had to be very specialized. And you had to have sort of a niche and you had to carve out a niche mm -hmm. in a particular field. And I think now, <coughs> because departments have shrunk over the years, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, universities, departments uh, that are looking to hire are looking for people who are versatile. Mm. And not just versatile in the classroom, um, but also in terms of you know what they can bring to the department, mm -hmm. um, in terms of administration, or in terms of digital humanities projects, things like that. When I started Continent Divided in 2010, um, as I said, I had, well, I'd been promoted and I'd, uh, to, uh, I'd received tenure and I was a full professor by that time. Mm -hmm. And I uh, could pretty much do, pursue any project that I wanted. Uh, but if I had been an assistant professor working on a digital humanities project, uh, I, that would have been, that would not have been a smart move uh, because as an assistant professor, you're expected to publish. Right. And I had already done that. Mm -hmm. So I had the luxury of, of uh, working on a you know, digital humanities project. My point simply is that in 2010, nobody took digital humanities all that seriously. Right. And that's not true now. Right. So in 2024, a graduate student who uh, is not only writing, but who has um, digital humanities experience, like mapping experience, mm -hmm. ArcGIS experience. Mm -hmm. Those are tools that I think are really um, uh, marketable. And uh, that's, I guess, the advice that I would give, um, that it, the, the, the profession has changed quite a bit uh, than when I was coming onto the market in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, have as many tools in your toolkit as you can, uh, and I think you'll be uh, a better fit for, for, more, for many departments. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate uh, your willingness to interview and Thanks, enjoyed Joe. the conversation. All right. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.